Welcome, I'm Prudence Robertson, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Advancing abortion on demand. Senate Democrats continue to push their pro-abortion agenda, making it clear they aren't backing down. Their latest push? 20 plus lawmakers are pressing President Biden to take executive actions on abortion. We're joined by EWTN News Nightly Capitol Hill correspondent, Eric Rosales with the details. Holding politicians accountable. The nonprofit political advocacy group, Catholic Vote, has launched its Catholic Accountability Project ahead of the midterm elections. We focus on Catholic politicians who openly flaunt their opposition to church teachings with Tommy Valentine at Catholic Vote. Pro-life apologetics. Scholars respond to key claims by the abortion industry in a new book, Choose Life. Dr. Tara Sander Lee of the Charlotte Lozier Institute joins us to discuss her contribution which focuses on the biology of prenatal development. Senator Elizabeth Warren and over 20 other senators are working with President Biden to advance abortion on demand. A recent letter to the president signed by these senators demands that executive action be taken to cement in extreme pro-abortion policies. Their requests would essentially weaponize the Department of Health and Human Services in favor of the abortion lobby. Some of their demands include increasing dangerous chemical abortions, more insurance coverage for abortions, hiring more people to promote abortion, and designating federal property for new abortion facilities. And joining me now for more details on this is Eric Rosales, Capitol Hill correspondent for EWTN News Nightly. Eric, thanks for joining me. Tell me what you know about this recent letter that pro-abortion senators directed to President Biden. Is there a chance that he fulfills any of these requests? Well, I tell you what, Prudence, we're all, we're all hoping that they won't actually uh, have any chance of making it here. But yeah, more than two dozen Democratic senators, they really want to be a, have President Biden sign these executive orders. And these are executive orders that can only be taken away if they are deemed unlawful. They, basically, what they want is President Biden to come out with a nationwide abortion plan. And as you mentioned, it is uh, led by Senators Patty Murray and Elizabeth Warren. And yeah, they'd be able, they want to be able to have access, more access to uh, these prescription abortion pills, to be able to use money for transportation so that if someone needs to be able to go to another state to have an abortion performed, that the federal government will give them money so that they can be able to ride a train, get on a bus, or get on a plane. And they also want to be able to use federal money to be able to fund um, access to these abortions on federal land. That would mean that you would be able to have taxpayer money being used, such as on military basis, in order to perform abortions. This is something that we haven't seen in the last 30 to 40 years. Mm, it's just astounding. And I know that you've spoken with Republicans in the House and the Senate on this. What did they have to say? Are they taking any action? Well, I, I tell you what, I spoke with members of the Pro-Life Caucus and also the Freedom Caucus, and they're going to fight this with tooth and nail. They say that, you know, these executive actions, like I mentioned, the only way that they can actually uh, be taken away is if they're deemed unlawful. So they plan to be able to bring lawsuits on the federal level, and then they're also asking their governors on the state level to be able to file uh, lawsuits. And who knows, this may be an issue that if President Biden does do these executive orders, that would go all the way to the Supreme Court. Mm, very interesting. And based on some recent statements from Chuck Schumer, it seems like Senate Democrats are still focused on codifying the so-called Women's Health Protection Act, which many have taken to calling the Abortion on Demand Act. Can you remind us just how extreme this bill is? Yeah, this is so extreme. I mean, this is an abortion on demand. You know, it's failed in both the House and the Senate. Uh, well, it's failed in both the House and the Senate just last year, twice. This is abortion on demand. This is even abortion after the baby is born. Minutes after the baby is born, you can end up deciding on whether or not you want this child to live or die. And several even pro-abortion Republican senators like Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins, they have decided not to support this bill. 
And another reason that they say is because it, uh, there's no conscious protections in it. They said that they would support codifying Roe, but without any conscious protections for doctors to prevent them from performing these abortions because of conscious protection rights or uh, whether or not uh, they don't want to be able to have abortion on demand even after the baby is born. That is the reason why, why these Catholic senators have decided to vote against it. Even Democratic Senator Joe Manchin has decided that he is not going to support this because of the lack of conscious protection rights for doctors. Well, that's encouraging at least. And you've reported that Senate Democrats have told you all of these pushes for more abortion are just the starting points for them. How much more extreme can they get, though? Well, I tell you what, they, uh, they say, I, I asked Senator Schumer during one of the press conferences, it's still the mission of the Democratic Party to codify Roe. And he says, yes, if the Women's Health Protection Act does not pass, uh, Senator Murray and a bunch of other senators, uh, Senator Warren, are going to continue to try other, may, uh, other measures to try and get these passed. If not, that is why they are asking President Biden to do the executive orders. But again, uh, uh, Republicans are hoping that come November that they'll be able to win the House and the Senate and they'll be able to push more of these pro-life agenda and get them passed. Of course, when it heads to the president's desk, more than likely they will just be vetoed. Mm. Well, it's unfortunate to see these Senate Democrats making these moves when we see so much pro-life momentum. And Eric, aside from abortion, what else is top of mind for lawmakers on Capitol Hill right now? Well, of course, with the recent shootings that took place in Uvalde, gun control is still a major issue up here, along with more COVID relief. And the Build Back Better plan, they actually want to be able to piece that together and, uh, and, and separate that into little bills to be able to have everything from climate change to uh, reducing the deficit. Um, they want to be able to pass those bills so that uh, both sides, so that they can be able to get some relief for the American people. You know, a lot of the Republicans are saying that this inflation that, that we're seeing across the board, everything from gas prices to the border crisis, these are all the result of President Biden's policies. And they say that until President Biden goes back to changing some of the some of these policies, that there's uh, no way that we're going to be we're going to continue to see this inflation continue on up until even next year. So um, we're all kind of counting our pennies right now, uh, <laughs> trying to just make sure. But we're going to continue to stay on the pro-life issue up here on Capitol Hill and uh, bring bring you the very latest on the developments of that. Well, thank you so much for that, and you're reporting each and every day, Eric Rosales of EWTN News Nightly. Thank you. Catholic Vote has launched its Catholic Accountability Project ahead of the midterm elections this fall. The campaign seeks to hold Catholic leaders and institutions accountable to foundational moral Catholic teachings. The initiative comes during a time in which many Catholic politicians openly flaunt their opposition to church teachings. Catholic Vote is already running ad campaigns and educational resources to make sure Catholic voters know where their representatives stand. Catholic Vote is working in coordination with faithful church leaders, bishops, and grassroots lay activists. And joining me now is Tommy Valentine, director of the Catholic Accountability Project at Catholic Vote. Tommy, thanks so much for joining me. Tell us about the Catholic Accountability Project. What is its goal? Yeah, well, our goal is to hold Catholic leaders, Catholic institutions accountable um, for how they represent the Catholic faith in the public square. So we're talking about um, politicians is the main part of it, but we're also looking at Catholic universities, Catholic hospitals, that's a big issue that's, sure. that's gonna be relevant very soon. Um, and we wanna make sure that they're representing the Catholic faith and more importantly, not misrepresenting the Catholic faith. Right. So we're working on elections and things like that and um, investigative reports and um, there's a lot more to come. Mm, that's really exciting. And you launched this campaign in January of this year. Can you give some insight into how it's been going so far? Yeah, it's been going really well. Um, we hear from our supporters all the time, you know, thank you, I'm so glad somebody's doing this mm -hmm. because it really is demoralizing to the Catholic laity when people who identify as Catholic stand in opposition publicly, very vocally, to everything that we believe is Catholic, the most fundamental truths in it. Um, and so people are just glad that we're, that we're doing this and we're working very hard and um, putting my history degree a good use <laughs> writing some right. investigative reports and that's been good. <laughs> yeah, I was a history major too, so that's yep. probably fun for you, honestly. Exactly. Um, Catholic Vote outlined recently House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's record on abortion in a fantastic investigative report really went into detail. Can you talk to me about the importance of really diving deep into these records? Yeah, you know, Speaker Pelosi is an interesting one because, you know, a lot of Democrats like Tim Kaine, 
um, John Kerry, they would at least pretend to put up a facade that, you know, I'm Catholic, I'm pro-life in my personal life, but I'm, you know, pro-choice politically, and I don't think the two should mix, should, should mix. And obviously, that's just, it's so wrong on every level, but at least there's an acknowledgement that there's some sort of conflict. Sure. Whereas Nancy Pelosi, she celebrates abortion in the name of her Catholic faith. And so in the report, we went through all the documented instances that we could find, and there are probably many more that we couldn't find, of times when she said, I'm a Catholic, and that's why I support abortion. Mm. She's even called abortion sacred. Mm. Um, she, there's this anecdote that probably happened once decades ago, and she tells it all the time about how she, she mocks people who would say, you know, Nancy Pelosi thinks she knows more about abortion than the Pope does. And she says, well, yes, I do know more, more about abortion than the Pope does. And she just has, it's clear, she's just making a mockery of the faith, which yeah. is really sad. Right, absolutely. And, you know, Joe Biden is another very notable person who does the same thing. And, yeah. you know, it's really important to be calling him out on this. Could you tell us how your organization is educating Catholic voters about the lies that he spreads? Yeah, well, we have something called the Biden Report on our website, and so it's basically a dossier of everything that Biden has said and done as president, even before he was president, um, on issues of importance to Catholics. So life, marriage, religious freedom, um, even some of the economic issues and sure. immigration that we things that we that we care about as Catholics, and we just want Catholics to know what Joe Biden is is saying in the name of our faith. Um, you know, he's a he's from Scranton, Pennsylvania. I have my roots are from Scranton, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and many generations going back. And um, he used to put himself up as this you know Catholic boy from Scranton. He's not anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad. He's you know nearing 80 years old and. Um, and he's still um, in conflict with his faith. So we're just making sure that Catholics are aware that Joe Biden may claim to be, you know, the second Catholic president, but his actions, regardless of what his personal faith is, I don't right. want to speak to his personal faith, yeah. but um, Catholics need to know what he's doing publicly. Mm. Tommy, we have about uh, less than a minute left, but what other politicians should we be keeping an eye on? Yeah, well, we're working on a list of politicians that we're going to be targeting in the elections this year. Got it. Um, a number of Catholic Democrats, unfortunately, there are very few left um, who actually uh, vote pro-life, but we're working to knock them out of office, working to get a number of Catholic politicians into office and um, get people who are really going to represent our faith and speak the truth um, into Congress and other offices around the country. So look forward to that on our website very, very soon. Very excited for it, and your work is so important. Thank you so much. Tommy Valentine of Catholic Vote. Thank you, Prudence. A new staff member at Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America joins us today, Katie Glenn, the group's new state policy director. Katie has worked for many years as government affairs counsel at the powerhouse pro-life group, Americans United for Life. She has a law degree from the University of Florida. Katie has been admitted to the bars of Iowa and the District of Columbia and has dedicated her career to advancing policies that protect unborn babies in states all over the country. And Katie joins me now in studio to talk more about her new role with Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America. Katie, thanks so much for being here. It's great to be back with you. Yeah. Uh, so we spoke with Marjorie Dannenfelser last week about how a big part of SBA's expansion is going to be in the states. And as their new state policy director, I'm sure you can share a lot of details about that. Yeah, I know one of the things Marjorie's been saying is that we used to fight a one-front war, and we are now a 51-front war. <laughs> so that's really our goal here with SBA, Pro-Life America, even the name. You know, we are not looking at this as a congressional issue or a D.C. issue. This is about everyone in America and the millions of pro-lifers around this country who haven't always felt heard. Mm, absolutely. And tell me about the work that you did at Americans United for Life and how that really prepared you for this moment that we're about to see, you know, hopefully a post-Roe world. So when I was tallying up the numbers, <laughs> I realized I testified in 17 different states wow. uh, over three years with AUL. And so it was great, uh, great practice for what we're going to do in spades. And I think one of the things I really love doing is training other people how to communicate with lawmakers. Sure. So we are going to not just, um, you know, be the best at that within SBA, mm -hmm. but also help others um, feel comfortable reaching out to their lawmakers, um, encouraging people in their community, whether it's doctors or other lawyers. You know, anybody has a voice in this, and we want all of them to get out there and, and make their voice heard. Right. And, you know, we know that people in the states, they're not waiting for Roe versus Wade to be overturned. They're already passing pro-life laws. So based on the layout of those laws, what are some states that should be looked to as models for advancing policies that protect babies? Well, there are a couple of states that are going to be on the ballot right away. Kansas has a special election um, on their ballot in August, actually, mm -hmm. um, to 
put a right to life into the Kansas Constitution, so we'll be looking at that very closely. Mm -hmm. Kentucky passed a huge omnibus bill. I got to go to Frankfurt and help out with that last year. Um, but they also have life on the ballot. Uh, so those are some of the states that will get the first chance at this. I know there are a few others that are looking at special sessions. Sure. Um, Indiana, a lot of their lawmakers have been in the press, I think, trying to urge their governor um, into this. So we'll see a lot this fall, but then even more in January, you know, we're going to hopefully have a lot of new freshmen coming in. Right. They're going to be fired up. They're going to have had uh, door knockers walking the streets for them, encouraging their pro-life neighbors to get out and vote. And so we'll want to work with them in January to go even further. Sure. Well, we'll certainly be keeping in touch with you about all of those states. And, you know, Katie, we talk a lot on the show about the importance of advancing public opinion on abortion in order to change the culture. But can you speak to how having laws on the books is also such an important aspect of advancing a culture of life? Well, one of the things we do with pro-life laws is we tell people what Roe v. Wade actually does, sure. what abortion really is. This is an opportunity to communicate that. I live in Florida where we passed a 15-week gestation law this year. Um, a lot of people in our state don't even know that we had abortions past 15 weeks. So to educate them so that they say, wait, I, I don't want that. I don't want a six-month-old baby to be aborted here in Florida. That's not what we're about. Um, maybe 15 weeks, you know, is, is a little bit more where my values are, but maybe it's not. Maybe I actually need to say, I want to go further. So I think it's a great way to educate the public and to get people thinking about this because we know that, you know, while some polls will say things like 70% of Americans want to keep Roe v. Wade, that same 70% of Americans is very comfortable with the Mississippi law at 15 weeks gestation or even moving further towards birth, uh, towards conception than that. Mm. So, you know, there's a clear disconnect. People don't know what Roe means. Right. And when they find out, they say, I'm not for that. Yes. Well, you are clearly very knowledgeable on this issue and a great asset in addition to the SBA team. Thank you so much for joining us, Katie Glenn. Thanks. We have an update on the five aborted babies who recovered in March from a D.C. abortion clinic. Authorities will now allow a private autopsy on the five aborted babies, which will provide more clarity about the way in which these brutal abortions were carried out. Violence is always wrong, and we should enforce the criminal law against anyone committing violence, whether you agree with their politics or disagree with their politics. Violence is unacceptable, and in the case of these unborn children, the violence that was visited upon them, that took their lives, it is against the law. Senator Ted Cruz joined the progressive anti-abortion uprising group last week during a press conference where he spoke about defending life at every stage and demanded answers about the tragic deaths of these children. Powell's lawyer has reached a verbal agreement with the D.C. Medical Examiner's Office. No word yet on when the autopsy will take place. Coming up, an online news article aims to promote the false idea that within the Catholic Church, there are two legitimate sides of the abortion debate. I speak out. Plus, a new book debunks false assertions made by the abortion industry. We're joined by Dr. Tara Sander Lee of the Charlotte Lozier Institute next. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Prudence Robertson. All eyes are on the Catholic Church when it comes to the abortion debate, and the faithful are hurting for clarity when it comes to this important issue. I speak out. A recent piece at the Wall Street Journal focuses on the, quote, Catholic divide over the politics of abortion and promotes the false idea that within the church there are two legitimate sides of the debate as to whether or not abortion is the preeminent evil in our society. It also notes that U.S. Catholic bishops from around the country are gathering in California this week for a spiritual retreat where they will discuss, quote, polarization in the country and the church, among other topics. This polarization has been under a bright spotlight for a few weeks now, since House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was denied the reception of communion in her home diocese of San Francisco due to her rampant promotion of abortion on demand. This piece is problematic because it legitimizes claims that there could be other issues that are just as important as abortion. 
But since the foundations of our faith, it's been made abundantly clear that there is one truth when it comes to how Catholics must address the tragedy of abortion. We have only to look to our catechism for clarity, which is defined as containing the essential and fundamental content of Catholic faith and morals based on scripture and tradition. It says this, Formal cooperation in an abortion constitutes a grave offense. The church attaches the canonical penalty of excommunication to this crime against human life. This is a very simple teaching, and Catholic leaders throughout the church and the world should all be committed to defending it. A recently published book, Choose Life, answering key claims of abortion defenders with compassion, debunks false assertions made by the abortion industry. The book contains 20 well-informed essays by pro-life scholars, physicians, and researchers. Three of those scholars are with the Charlotte Lozier Institute. CLI Senior Fellow and Director of Life Sciences, Dr. Tara Sandra Lee's essay focused on the science of prenatal development. She writes, quote, Sadly, so many innocent babies have been killed by abortion because they are not regarded as persons. And joining us now is Dr. Tara Sanderley herself to discuss with us this great new book. Tara, thanks so much for joining us. In Choose Life, you say that women facing an unplanned pregnancy are told lies about the baby growing inside of them. Could you elaborate on that for us? Yeah, absolutely. So sadly, millions of babies have been aborted because the abortion industry works very hard to lie to these women, to the fathers, to the families, and in trying to convince them that the unborn child is not a real human being growing inside the mother's womb, that this is not a human being with, with hands and fingers and toes and a heartbeat. So they work very hard to convince the, the public and mothers that come in, especially they're facing an unplanned pregnancy, that this is just a clump of cells and to ignore the true science that this um, of the humanity of the unborn child. And so it's really a sad, um, it's really sad that there are so many lies and misinformation. I mean, we don't have to look far. The New York Times, NPR, a lot of liberal mainstream media is working very hard to convince the public that the unborn child is not a real human being. And we just know that that's not the truth. Science tells us that that's not the truth. Yes, and speaking of misinformation, one interesting fact that you noted is the reality that Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider, dehumanizes preborn babies regularly. You point out that they avoid using the word baby at all costs when referring to an unborn child, and instead they refer to babies as pregnancy tissue. Can you speak to the power of words when it comes to things like this? Yeah, so words are so incredibly important, especially for a woman that's coming in with an unplanned pregnancy and she's scared and she has a lot of doubts and she's not sure what to do. The words that are being used in that moment are so important. And when they go out of their way to dehumanize the unborn child and not tell them the truth about their child, that that child is a real human being from the point of conception all the way up until birth and using terms like pregnancy tissue. I mean, quite frankly, this is we're now seeing that journals such as JAMA, which were previously reputable, are now um, they are losing their credibility because they are even avoiding real scientifically accurate terms, such as even the fetus, that they will go out of their way to not to use terms like this and use dehumanizing terms like pregnancy tissue to describe the child growing inside. I mean, is this the point that we've come to? I mean, it, it, that we're describing the child growing inside as pregnancy tissue, so that if that's the case, then what are babies outside the womb, post-pregnancy tissue? I mean, <laughs> if that's the case, you know, I just took my post-pregnancy tissue to um, his basketball camp last week, <laughs> so it's just, it's kind of ridiculous to the, um, the extremes that they're going to to avoid using terms that humanize the unborn child. Right. And talk to us, Dr. Lee, about the stages of human development and how we know that life does, in fact, begin at conception. So centuries of scientific evidence provide indisputable proof that the unborn child is a human being from the very moment of conception when the sperm fertilizes the egg. And we know that that new living child is unique from day one. And that child has a beating heart by the, by actually by 
three weeks and one day post-conception. That's just the, during the sixth week of gestation in pregnancy. And not only is the heart beating, the heart is beating rhythmically at about 100 beats per minute. We know that the child has their developing, fully developed hands, fingers, toes, feet that are even wiggling by eight weeks after conception. And that that baby actually has over 90% of the bodily structures already in place by that very early stage in the first trimester. The babies feel pain from as early as possibly 12 weeks. So it's just remarkable. And that's not even to mention all the behaviors that we know because of ultrasound. We know that babies can suck their thumb and they actually have a preference for whether they're left-handed or right-handed by 15 weeks. So the humanity of the unborn child is um, is completely undeniable and it's true. And that anybody that ignores that science is just absolutely ignoring, right. ignoring and the truth. Everything you're saying just proves that every human life is a miracle. You know, Tara, for our last question, it could you speak to the importance of having a book like this where people focused on all different specialties can come to the same conclusion that abortion kills an innocent life and truly has no place in our society? Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, as we talked earlier, if we use these dehumanizing words, it creates doubt in women. This is just used as a, as a way to salve um, these extreme abortionists, they're, they're soothe their own conscience and extreme um, position on abortion. And so a book like this is such an important research, a resource at, the, at such a time as this. It allows people to really equip themselves for the battle that is ahead. I mean, we 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 are hopeful that the Dobb decision will rule in favor of Mississippi, um, that will protect unborn life um, as early as 15 weeks, and hopefully even return it back to the states. So when people hear all the misinformation and lies that are out there, this book is such an important research resource to so that w people can equip themselves and then speak that truth in love to so many people that that need to hear the truth and in a in a, in a culture that desperately needs um, to hear about what the true science says about the undeniable humanity of these unborn children amen well thank you for all the work that you put into this great book hope all of our viewers will read it dr tara sander lee senior fellow and director of life sciences at the charlotte Lozier institute thank you Thank you. Before we say goodbye, we would like to wish a happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We hope you enjoy your special day, and to my dad especially, happy Father's Day. Thank you for all that you've done for me. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Prudence Robertson. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing ProLifeWeekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.